want to be seen and not be rendered invisible. So I think you touched on some of the basic things in life just so well. And the book, of course, that is around what happened to you, not what's wrong with you, but rather what happened to you. Then you get a different engagement. So it's a different perspective. It's a way of positioning our questions, our interactions, our entry into any arena in a new way with a different foresight. Thank you for framing um, what we'll be delving into in a short while. What Dr. Uh, Shafika Isaacs mentioned is her colleague, Dr. Nikki Roberts, who is actually our keynote for this particular theme. And it's all about how corporates should best partner with schools. All those insights that the Telcom Foundation has learned, of course, over the years uh, will be coming through in a moment with Dr. Nikki Roberts from the University of Johannesburg. And um, she's also the director of Geller Law Consulting, which is a research and design company established in the year 2000, which works with public and private investors, particularly in education and training. So we all know, I mean, we're past the age where you can just swoop in with an imperialist mindset it and think that you can solve people's problems, that you have all the answers, that this is all about collaboration. So please, let's welcome to the stage Dr. Nikki, um, Dr. Nikki Roberts. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, I'm going to be talking today specifically around connected schools, but thinking about that in the way in which Dr. Isaacs has framed things, which is that we have children at the center of everything that we're doing. So I'm going to be first talking a little bit about holistic school development, and I think quite a bit of that is uh, covered throughout this conference. I'm not going to labor it. And then moving on to partnering with schools and what we know about that. Some reflections on measuring success, because I think how we measure is beyond the S of ESG. Uh, and then to reflect on key areas of need and opportunity that face us currently uh, in South Africa. So holistic school improvement. I was asked to please define and distinguish holistic school improvement from systemic change from simple interventions. But I realize I'm not lecturing to masters and PhD students. Um, so I'm assuming that most of you know a lot about that, that the way in which you're working is more holistic, aiming to influence systemic change, and is not about a simple knock and drop, look at me philanthropy, simple intervention. So I do have to frame this talk on connectivity in what has changed since we started doing this in 1994 when I was doing a master's in new media where I learned to code in HTML? Things have changed quite radically in 30 years. So I do have to admit that um, these responses came from a couple of prompts from um, chat GPT. It's fundamentally changing the way in which we think, the way we present, the way that we work. So I used three uh, quick prompts following my brief of what I needed to do, and this is not me, this is AI who are giving you definitions. So I know that AI means that the machine can learn. I wanted to make sure that I was then deepening the way in which I was asking. So repeat, but include some references. <clears throat> and finally, focus on the integration of ICTs for each example and give me an APA referencing style, submit to Elsevier for publication. <laughs> I think it's just important to realize how much is changing in the field of digital technology and that these are the skills at the heart of what we need our children, who are national assets, who are our agents for change, to have access to. Um, Shavika has referred to the complexity of working in schools in South Africa and realizing that ICT integration sits within a school within a district, within a province, within a country. Um, and that our quality indicators are then complex. If you're able to track analytics, what is it that you're tracking? Is it attendance? Is it engagement from teachers in their content knowledge? Um, what is it that are the binding constraints that impact how much one can do in a school? <clears throat> I had the opportunity at the beginning of this year to be addressing the national department 
um, at its annual Lechotle around ICT integration in schools. And I thought, what an opportunity to now flip that presentation given to the state, to the private sector, and to Trialog and its NPOs, to be thinking about what is it that gives us quality with regard to education in general um, and to ICT in integration in particular. So I've mostly wanted to point you to a couple of things that the state has been doing to try and lead, um, or at least advise, <clears throat> and align some of what's being done. So one of the things that the Telcom Foundation has supported is more at a thought leadership systemic level, where they uh, were enhancing the state, providing opportunity to be responding to COVID, and to be saying, what is it that we expect digital schools to be looking at? And the state then drew together a range of these quality standards. So if you're looking to create a strategy that says, what are the pieces of education? Don't reinvent it. Have a look at what the state's already provided. <clears throat> I think it's really important to realize that our schooling system is 27,000 schools. I think they're 18,000 primary schools. And to know that what a corporate social investment intervention can do is the very tip of the iceberg. So how do you make sure that that intervention is something that complements the stability of the state? So where the state needs to be sure that there's one message, there's one curriculum, there's one way of approaching things, the expectations about how schooling works. What CSI allows is what I call the little sailboats. So being able to be agile, to be focused, to be adapted, and then importantly, to feed those learnings into the big ship. So I would encourage CSI investments to be making sure that you are being agile in support of the big ship, so in engagement with the department. We're talking about having 10% innovation, 90% stability. I think it is one of the things over the last 30 years that in the last two decades, we have at least had stability in curriculum, a sense of what the priorities are, a five-year annual plans, a national development plan that allow us to align in ways that we weren't uh, just post-democracy. A really important piece that I say repeatedly to all those on CSI boards and on guiding intervention, uh, it takes time. This is not something that gets measured in years or even five-year cycles. Education change takes, year, takes decades. I would encourage the Tiger Brands, I think it was Mary Jane, <coughs> not to re-look at what you're doing, but look at how you deepen and expand. You can't waste five years of investment in figuring out how to be feeding and building school gardens to be shifting radically. What's needed is to be using that information, sharing it and getting it embedded into the system. So I know with the ESG requirements, we're really responding to the sustainable development goals. And at the heart of that for an education intervention is quality education. But sitting around that, you also have to look at we need decent work. So how is that education leading into decent work? How are we being responsible in terms of what we're consuming? How we are getting rid of and not accepting uh, dumping of our technologies into Africa? What's our climate action? And then importantly, what are our partnerships? Um, and so I think it's really important to see the development goals in working in concert. So there are several guidelines that I think um, are important for those who are looking at uh, ICT integration in schools. The first one relates to ICT partnerships. The second to multigrade teaching and the ways in which multigrade schools are in serious need. Virtual schooling and how does that work? So what are the virtual schools and the legislative frameworks around homeschooling, virtual schooling, distance learning, as well as the way in which digital content is produced, shared, made available on all platforms, not only uh, zero rated on particular platforms. These are, this is the time for collaboration, not for market competition. Um, these are the guidelines which Telcom Foundation supported the DBE um, in producing and do allow for engagement with the department and the e-learning um, activities. So 
the topic was partnering with schools. I'm not going to go through the ICT partnerships document just to alert you to it it's on the DBA website. If you can't find it, my email's at the end and I'll send it to you. But basically the intention was to create a vision for the use of ICT in education, a roadmap for how to work at national and provincial level, and then for an advocacy and communication strategy. So there were several principles agreed to in collaboration between the DBE and partners working in ICT and education. Many of them are familiar, um, but really importantly, I think putting learners first and teachers as central is a key piece. To me, the biggest threat is some uh, global multinational company comes in and says, let's bypass the teachers, add an extra layer of technology and off we go so that you kind of have the icing on the cake, let the system rot, it doesn't matter. To me, that's a real risk. It doesn't address any of our needs fundamentally, and bypassing teachers is not an option. So making sure that we are aware, one of the things that uh, Shavika pointed out was the importance of strengthening um, a capable and developmental state, that we are aware that in our investments that we are trying to build um, the governance structures that support schools. So the vision for ICTs in education is to creatively transform the learning experience of every child to realize their full potential by harnessing ICTs. And a vision for partnership, because again, this is an opportunity for a range of, of uh, public and private sector partners to work together. So government, together with willing partners, growing an effective network of collaborators to systemically respond to, catalyze, and expand ICT provision to creatively transform the learning experience of every child to realize their full potential. I think that's a vision we can get behind. One of the key things in relation to principles is that if you're taking that big ship little sailboat analogy, is that the private sector and NGOs are in a position to be responsive. They're in a position to be innovative in ways that keeping the stability of the big ship is not possible. Um, but that's where our R&D is. That's where our research, innovation, and responsiveness sits. So it's really important to have things that are accessible. Um, I was delighted with COVID that finally our tech providers acknowledged that we can zero rate websites after decades of telling us that wasn't possible, um, that it took a global crisis for that to be unleashed. I still think that our data costs are outrageous um, and that it's one of the major inhibitors for effective use of ICTs and appeal to the uh, corporates, including telecom, to be addressing that as a national priority. Um, to me, free data for youth would be a fundamental shift in how youth engage in our country. Scalable, um, the scalability of interventions to me is understanding that you're working at that 10% innovation level, but you've got the eye on the horizon of the need for the 27,000 schools. And what is that you're doing in the 300, 100,000 schools that you're working in, which is gonna teach about how to uh, steer the big ship. Measuring success. Whenever I talk about technologies in schools, someone puts up their hands and asks me the toilet question. Um, so, and that question goes like this, why are you putting technology into schools when we have pit latrines? And it's a valid question, right? It's three, three decades of intervention in ICTs in schools and we still have people drowning in pit latrines. The pit latrine problem is a complex one. It's really hard to get a flush toilet when there is no access uh, to piped water. Ways of thinking about how decompost, uh, composting tool, uh, toilets and that type of thing is something that is on the DBE agenda. It is reported on in six monthly cycles. So it is something that still needs to be addressed. What we also see though with ICT investments is not just ignoring the toilet question, but also being quite anachronistic. So I've given this example of a 1970s burgundy bathroom Right? For me, I can place it. That was the 70s. It was so clear. I can tell you we were with Y2K. We were with 21st century skills. We were with 4IR. And when you're using those little catchphrases, I can place it exactly 
in terms of the decade that you're referring to. And I think a lot of people who are investing in ICTs in education get onto the hype of 4IR or whatever it is, digital revolution, um, with very little substance behind it. To me, I see them as the purple bathrooms, the burgundy bathroom people. Um, I hope you have a new framing. <laughs> but that you're using ways in which these catchphrases actually can be deepened um, and to be used particularly in thinking about a holistic approach to what you're doing to enable that full potential of the children whose lives you're touching. So I think it's important that we realize that a lot of what is done in corporate social investment is a knowledge project. Many of the boards I talk to assume that we know the answers and that the government's just corrupt and inefficient and un unable to do it. It's not true that we have the answers. We have a lot of international work about how to teach children to read. We have very little on how to teach children to read in Isizulu. We have very little around understanding what, how many words per minute should you be reading in Sisutu, Chitsonga, um, Pedi, Kosa, and so on. And so knowing that what corporates can do is invest in the research project is a fundamental part of my keynote. So I think it's really important to have a theory of change. That's not a big kind of academic thing. It's the idea that you have knowledge, you have some theory that we already know. We've been investing in South Africa for 30 years in this kind of way. There are lots of global lessons. We then have beliefs and assumptions about what we're going to do. We have a strategy and then we aim for results. The key piece that I see missing in the CSI environment is that what happens to those results is that they may end up in the trialogue booklet, which is very welcome and congratulations on 25 years. But to what extent are those lessons shared? So that Tiger Brand's lessons are not repeated by the next food company that's trying to do its work. So I would encourage sharing and publication of work essentially to be building the knowledge that allows us to do this better over time. So deep dives at the micro level inform and improve investments at the macro level. Um, and I'll recall um, Dr. Isaac's intervention in Telcom Foundation of a micro level intervention to learn that our children want to be seen. And how do we do that in, in unleashing their potential once they are seen? So I think it's really important to realize that the knowledge project is not just what do we know, but also starting to ask what should we know? We don't actually know our children was something that drove the Telcom Foundation. And that we then get usable results that influence our beliefs, our strategy, and our results. Um, so the key piece there is that you're getting usable knowledge as opposed to just knowledge that sits in a project steering committee. Um, I'm moving on now to the components around what makes a successful intervention. And I know I've been going for 16 minutes. I will make sure I try not to get to 30. Um, success factors. I think it's really important to have clarity of purpose. And for that to be aligned to business objectives, we heard that this morning in the conversation, it doesn't make any sense for a food company to be in connectivity or a connectivity company to be develop, uh, delivering food. Clarity of purpose aligned to the state. And this is a theory of change on the screen, which is the DBE's theory of change, which importantly puts teachers at the center. For a system to function, it, can only, it cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. The teachers are at the middle are, and are in service of the learners, which you see that as above. And then you have curriculum, continuous professional development, all the pieces that allow a teacher to be effective. Um, and then the supporting or management components are shown in the brown. So I would encourage uh, partners to engage with the DBE theory of change, develop your own because it does need to be at a much smaller scale, but thinking about the ways in which what your little piece does contributes to the national picture. To be enacting principles and to be deliberate about which principles you're choosing and why, and therefore to be measuring against those. So if you are 
um, picking inclusiveness, to know that the multi-grade school with African dominant, African language dominant classrooms, the mud hut space, is an investment that requires a whole lot of things to allow those schools to come into the mainstream. That you are looking deliberately for equity and redress. So working in um, quintile five schools and working in private schools is not addressing a principle of redressing um, inequality. So a key component is to be targeting together with the department proactive redress and to be knowing that that requires more than just what it is that you might have as your core deliverable or your core knock and drop, connectivity, coding skills, robotics, whatever it is that your purple bathroom is at that moment, it's going to have to sit within a whole lot of other um, pieces to make sure that you do get a genuine uh, change at that school um, and that it's brought in to the digital world. Key to that um, is to ensure that you are designing for the knowledge project from the outset. Too often I'm phoned and said, can you please do a retrospective evaluation on what we've done? I know that you need it for the annual report. I know you need it to go into your ESG. It's too late. You need to be seeking the advice and support of those who are working in this area in a deep way from the outset of your strategy. And to be commissioning monitoring and evaluation as research and learning partners who work with you along a five to 10 year journey. Not to be able to stand on the side with white coats and tick boxes, but to be able to say, this isn't working, what do we do? How do we improve what we're doing? This is working, how do we expand? and to be contributing to that knowledge project. I've got two examples here. The one is the evaluation of the grade R maths project, an example where innovative research happened at small scale that led to funders coming together en masse to fund an entire provincial intervention for every grade R teacher in the Western Cape to be trained in mathematics and to have a way in which that was done. The impact of that showed positive learning gains, both at the learner level of what their mathematics knew, so we measured right from the outset what their mathematics learning was, as well as the teacher's knowledge of the mathematics and how to teach it. That led to, because it was published in peer-reviewed articles, it led to the department noticing it, even though it was in the Western Cape, Gauteng taking it on, replicating it, and there's now the, the Mathematics Language and Improvement Program being rolled out across the whole of Gauteng, making a significant difference. But it came from a small innovation from WordWorks, UCT, uh, the UCT's school development in, uh, unit and their work in mathematics on a small scale to then go to province and now to two provinces, hopefully national. But it's with that eye on the horizon of how do we take a small intervention that's working well and scale it through collaboration and partnership. The second example I'm not going to dwell on, but it's an example of the opposite of look at me philanthropy, if you like. Uh, the fuel project, which was to tackle the problem of nutrition in schools and to work collaboratively across funders, across competitors in the nutrition space to say, we're not gonna be saying this is a fuel intervention. In fact, we label the whole thing as the National Department's feeding scheme that now reaches the number of children that it reaches every day. Um, and to see that looking, let's make a capable state. We need feeding to be happening. And as the investors, we're gonna hide under the radar, stand behind and make the state shine. I think it's a really important example of uh, intervention between the public and private sector. Key areas of need and opportunity, I've got three more minutes. Um, I think it's worthwhile looking at what are the state's priorities. These are also the things that I presented back at the DBE uh, in January this year. Foundations for learning, we've had a huge amount of investment in education, in learning outcomes at matric level. Those foundations in terms of languages and mathematics in early grades really need attention and there is increasing attention happening, that's been happening in the last couple of years. Another core area of need is initial edu teacher education and I'll outline why. And then ongoing professional development. 
You can see that those are consistent with the DBE's theory of change and with its principles, teachers at the center, learners first. Foundations for learning. I think we see a lot about our multilingual country, but even the way in which we report on languages doesn't recognize our multilingual multilingualness um, or our bilingualness. So uh, Stats SA reports on the dominant languages. We don't have any overlapping. I'm like, where's the Venn diagrams? You know, people speak English and Zulu. They speak Zulu and Klosa. They've got a whole range of languages available. And we're not engaging, particularly at the foundation phase level, at bilingual and multilingual materials. So I've got an example here just from uh, mathematics where the importance of defining multiplication in a particular way in response to the African language dominant framing is important. In English, we talk about five groups of four, but in uh, Klose, we're talking about five repeated four times. And we're doing that because of the way in which the multiplication is described in East Klose. So you see that our translations of the workbooks show a picture of kind of four hands, um, four hands with five fingers each, and you're then seeing that the closer version actually gives what should be a picture of five groups with four apples in it, right? And you've got this mismatch between what you're hearing linguistically as a child and what you're seeing in the workbooks. There's a lot of work that's needed on making sure that we have quality African language materials that address our bilingual needs, that even in rural Eastern Cape, children are learning in Isikosa, they need to be transitioning into English with a bilingual English uh, closer framing. We also have a need for digital learning materials, which are appropriately available and are on zero rated sites particularly in African languages and leveraging what the opportunities of digital uh, technology offer in relation to translations and switching between uh, multiple languages. We haven't done adequately in that regard. We have got pieces, but all of it is mono multilingual. So you receive one language, but not the interface between different languages. Initial teacher education is a massive quandary for me. I don't understand why we haven't been investing in it <clears throat> until quite recently. And that we pour huge amounts of work into ongoing teacher development once teachers are in schools. But if you look at the cycle, uh, the red component of being selected into an initial teacher education program, ultimately qualifying, potentially being having a new teacher qualification, a new teacher status, and finally being inducted as a, a license to practice. Um, we have very little investment in that uh, red role. And I think it's part of kind of expecting that universities know what they're doing, they can handle it. They don't, they need help, and they need support in relation to the same way that we've been supporting schools. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about why this is so urgent. So this is the, uh, our curve of the age of our teachers. We have a huge <clears throat> problem coming up, which is that our teachers currently in 2017 are in the 50 to 55 year bracket. That means that that big bulge of teachers is moving to the right as time goes on, and we have a massive retirement wave coming. That has pluses and minuses. It has pluses because we know that younger teachers are better qualified, more knowledgeable, and able to do more mathematics. Um, so our older teachers who come from Bantu education are leaving the system. My question is, what's the quality of teachers that are coming in at the bottom, and how are we supporting that in initial teacher education? So there's a huge need for making sure that the quality of teachers that are coming into the system is better than what it is now, so that any CSI intervention is working with a better teacher and has greater leverage. Finally, ongoing professional development. There are digital learning frameworks. There are stages of ICT integration. Working with the department on how to actualize that is helpful. And my summary. Success factors, clarity of purpose, enactment of principles, 
making sure that every time you're asking why are we doing this, you're checking whether it's increasing the divide or narrowing the divide. And that you are committed to the knowledge project because that's all an intervention at 10% of scale can do. Areas of need, foundation phase ECD, particularly multilingual investments, initial teacher education, and ongoing professional development. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Nikki Roberts. I think I always love it when we are provoked. You know, when someone just is like, just, po just poking you in certain areas.